Greetings, dear listeners. This is Jonah Goldberg, host of the Remnant Podcast, brought to you by the Dispatch and Dispatch Media. I know I've been teasing it for a long time, but uh, uh, Y Day is finally here. We have Yuval <laughs> Levin back on the podcast. Um, he's got, uh, for all of you who at this point don't know, shame on you, but uh, he is the head of the the shop I'm in at the American Enterprise Institute. The sequence of the the title I always mess up, so I'm I made myself ner- nervous. But it's social, political, cultural, and constitutional studies at the American Enterprise Institute. Um, he's the author of many books, which I have praised many times. Um, and the newest uh, and and arguably the most exciting is American Covenant: How the Constitution Unified Our Nation and Could Again. Uh, Yuval Levin, welcome back to the Remnant. Thank you so much, Joan. I appreciate that. And I like arguably the most exciting, um, which may be a low <laughs> bar given my other books, but I, I'm grateful for that. Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I really liked the. Um... The one from your dissertation, the the Payne Burke book, because um, it's it's rare when you run into something that actually changes the way you think about left and right. Well, I shouldn't say that. It's rare for me <laughs> um, to run into something that changes that, and so that was very useful to me. Um, and your last book, um, A Time to Build, was great as well. Uh, but enough of this love making. Um, what's your book about? Well, thank you. This uh, this book is a reintroduction to the Constitution that emphasizes especially its potential to help us better address the deep divisions of our society in what is a very divided time. So it's, first of all, a book about the Constitution. It's a way for readers to get acquainted and reacquainted with it, and I hope that readers would walk away with a deeper understanding of its aims and its parts and its history But this is a non-lawyerly book about the Constitution, and it's especially focused on our system as a framework for cohesion and unity, because I think that our understanding of the meaning of political unity has been really distorted by a kind of progressive monism that says that unity means we all think as one, and it's a view that's also seeped into the right uh, in our time. And the Constitution is actually rooted in a very different, more classically liberal or maybe conservative idea of unity that would serve us well now. And so the book tries to shed light on that idea, too. The the first chapter is called What is the Constitution? The last chapter is called What is Unity? I think both of those are harder questions than they might seem. And the book is really an effort to try to answer each of them by way of the other. Um. All right, so as as you as you know, you were something of a student of of my writings and ramblings. Um, I think unity is one of the most abused and misunderstood and yep. problematic concepts for all sorts of reasons, uh, from the evolutionary psychological to uh, the 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 desire to simply um, sort of use the appeal of unity to sneak in agendas that you don't want to argue, right? You know, uh, yep. never in my time have I ever heard anybody say, you know, it's so sh- such a shame we're so polarized and we're so divided. Um, it would be great if everyone could just drop their ideological um, hang-ups and work together. And so in that spirit, I'm going to abandon everything I believe and exactly. do what you want to do, right? It's always a way to get other people to shut up and get, get with your program. Um, So why don't you sort of start there and just sort of explain unity rightly and wrongly understood. Absolutely. And I think that that idea of unity, where unity means everybody should agree with me, is obviously the most common and popular in our political life now. If you look at the inaugural addresses of Donald Trump and Joe Biden, which I don't in the abstract recommend you doing, Um, you'd find that they're actually both about unity and in the same mistaken way. Um, And so Trump ends up saying, when America's unified, nothing can stop us. And Biden says, we have to approach our problems as the United States of America. And if we do it in a united way, then we're unbeatable. I don't think that's true. I think things can stop us. I think we're beatable. We have to work on succeeding in the world. And more importantly, they both imply that unity would mean that we're not arguing anymore, that we're not disagreeing with each other, that we're not constantly fighting about how we should move forward. Unity means we agree about how to move forward and we do it. And 
that is, first of all, it's an intuitive way to think about unity. I think it's also, in our politics, a distinctly kind of progressive way to think about unity. The American constitutional system starts from what I think of as a classical conception of politics, in which the political arena is an arena for working out differences and for doing so by action, by, by debate, by engagement, and by activity. And the idea of unity that is implicit in our Constitution says unity means not thinking alike, but acting together. Mm -hmm. And so how do you act together when you don't think alike? That, to me, is one of the core questions that the American Constitution exists to answer. A lot of its institutions, a lot of its modes and forms are about how do you act together when you don't think alike. And the answer that it offers is you force factions, parties, people who disagree to deal with each other, to compete, first of all, also to negotiate to engage with the reality of each other's existence. And I think that accepting that underlying reality is really one of the great insights of the Constitution. Madison in Federalist 10 has this wonderful blunt sentence. He says, as long as the reason of man continues fallible and he is at liberty to exercise it, different opinions will be formed, period. That is to say, if you've ever been in a group of people, then you know that we're not all going to agree. That's not how things work. The, the reality of disagreement is a function of freedom itself. And yet it doesn't make unity impossible because unity is about finding ways to work through that disagreement towards some common action when there's a necessity to act together. And our various institutions, federalism and the Congress and the, the forms of the executive and the judiciary, the party system, our politics, are all shaped in the weird ways that they are because of the need to act together when we don't think alike. Um, I want to come back to that Madison quote because I think I have a quibble with you about it. But um, uh, why don't we just, for to, to, to tether this to the ground a little bit, why don't you give me a for instance about how the Constitution actually is designed to to facilitate productive disagreement rather than productive unity. Yeah, so, I mean, for example, the, the, the foremost institution of our national government is the Congress, the national legislature. And the way the Congress is intended to function is actually different in a way that we have to pay attention to from the ways in which a lot of democratic parliaments function. Um, the Congress does not empower the narrowest of majorities to act in, in, a, in an assertive way. If you have a narrow majority in Congress, you've got to broaden that majority before you have any power. And the reason for that is that the Constitution is built on a concern about majority power. So that even though majority rule is ultimately the source of legitimacy in a democratic system, majority rule is also dangerous. You don't have to look too long at American history or really at the history of any democracy to see that that's true. And the system deals with that by forcing majorities to grow before they can be empowered. And that means that even when you win an election, you still have to deal with the people that you defeated. You still have to deal with the people who are around the table. And what you win in an American election is a seat at the negotiating table rather than the power to do anything and everything you want. That's very frustrating to a lot of people, and you find a lot of uh, pointing in the direction of parliamentary systems in the criticisms of the Constitution that you get from progressives 100 years ago as much as today. Um, but the American system says, no, you don't just get to do whatever you want by winning an election. An election decides who will be part of the process of working this out. And that process is a process of negotiation, a process of competition. When you look at the other parts of the system, you look at federalism, there again, the, the, the logic is not that we're going to come to one solution and the challenge for our government is to implement it. The idea is that there's going to be a permanent and continuous process of pushing and pulling and tugging and negotiating and working it out. And that ultimately is how we arrive at constructive modes of government. Um, so 
let's just get this low hanging fruit out of the way for a second. I brought it up on here, brought it up with you. Um, this whole democracy or republic thing, you've got, you've been working on this question. You got, we got colleagues who've been working on this question. We've had seminars about this question. Is it fair to say that democracy is the part where it's the me, it's the means by which we pick the people who are going to be in the room to have these negotiations and the people in this room using their judgment and their their best and and their and relying upon their sort of virtue and um the best versions of themselves is the republican part i mean how do you how do we separate out republican and democratic uh, how exhausted are you every time somebody says, <laughs> yeah. we aren't a democracy, we're a republic? Yeah, I, I think that's not a very constructive uh, – I, I think that's not a very constructive critique of any argument about the Constitution. Um, we are a democratic republic. That term is internally inconsistent on purpose, and I think that that kind of containing of what seem to be opposites is actually one of the modes by which our constitution works. So we absolutely do live under a system that takes it for granted that the source of political legitimacy um, is majority rule, and that majority rule is really ultimately the only way to determine the direction uh, of, of a self-governing politics. And yet, also sees that majority rule is a very dangerous thing, and majority rule can be very unwieldy and ineffective. And so it puts up a kind of balance um, that involves something more like deliberation and consultation and negotiation and bargaining. Um, and in some ways, that is more Republican. The, 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 the term Republican is just endlessly frustrating and complicated. Um, and for us, it's a hard term to define because it's kind of gone out of use in our political vocabulary. And parts of it have become part of what we mean by liberalism. Parts of it are what we mean by democracy. Parts of it really are just gone. But republic is also very hard to define when you look at the political discourse of the, of the founding era. And in some ways, they had the opposite problem. Their republic kind of meant everything. Right. And everybody wanted to be understood as republican. And so, for, you know, Madison in The Federalist says that um, he wants to distinguish Republican um, from monarchy and not just from democracy, but also from democracy, by mm -hmm. which he means something more like radical democracy, where the people rule directly. Um, and the uses of Republican are very hard to track and very hard to pin down. To my mind, Republicanism is something like the political vision of a self-governing society. It focuses on taking ownership of your society's present and future, of talking about it in terms of something that is your responsibility. And so it, it counterbalances the democratic ethos because it values not just what we each want, but also what our society needs. It counterbalances a kind of liber liberal ethos because it values not just rights, but also obligations. Um, and I, I think a lot of times when we talk about, I, I would say when I hear critics of, of liberalism saying our problem in America is that we have too much liberalism, I think that the best among them really mean that we have too little republicanism, mm -hmm. that we have too little of a focus on the common good and on obligations alongside rights. But we are a republic and we are a democracy. And the Constitution is certainly a democratic document. I think the progressive critics of it who say that it's not are mistaken about the character of the Constitution. It assumes in an underlying way that majority rule is the only source of legitimacy, but it also sees that majority rule is not the end of the story and that it's not enough when we think about the kinds of challenges we face. So not all the offices and not even all the offices that are elected are best understood as representative offices. Um, and in that sense, in the, in the most direct democratic way, um, we, we understand that there's a need to mitigate majority rule. And some of the ways it's mitigated, I think, are distinctly Republican in the American system. That's just a way of saying this is a messy soup. It doesn't really clarify it. And I, as you say, we've been working on this problem, uh, our, our kind of friends at AI and others, 
And that's because I think there is some value in recovering the language of republicanism, but it's not a simple matter. So this all, I'm actually, I have a vision of our endpoint here, um, where you rip off your mic and storm out of the room. So, but we'll get Excellent. there. Um, in the meantime, uh, so you said something along the lines, it's, it's messy and complicated by design, um, that this is something that's in the in the book, you have this great stuff about the role of competition in our system, which is sort of underappreciated. Um, it seems to me like, so as you know, Woodrow Wilson's not a friend of this podcast and, yes. um, not a friend of this book either. <laughs> I, I've, I'm not quite the, the vice president of the Woodrow Wilson haters club by the end of writing this book, but I'm very, very, uh, high on in the ranks of the organization. Right. So like the, 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 the cult of unity, I mean, if you take it seriously, right. Um, the cult of unity despises competition and yes. Wil Wilson talks about this. He's, you know, he thinks the idea of checks and balances is absurd. It's the idea. He, he compares it to the idea of like somehow the organs of the body fighting with each other exactly. and that the body politic needs to be an organic holistic whole everything working together, all pores pulling in the same direction. And somewhere de Tocqueville says, this is uh, called something, an example of a clear but false idea. It is a very seductive idea. It's just not true. Yeah. Um, this idea that, you know, that that's the way the government should work or whatever, uh, and all sorts of other things in life. Can you sort of point to sort of get to this point about the inherent contradictions and and deliberate ambiguities about like the role of the president, the role of, um, you know, you, you got to add into it a little bit conceptually with democracy versus Republican, but it's actually pretty concretized ambiguity in the actual structure and plain letter of the Constitution. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, th this is really part of the way in which the Constitution goes about addressing divisions and problems and resolving disputes in our society. I think that the, the the foremost way that it does that is through competition, and it sets competing factions in competition with each other through elections, but also through the ways that the, that the branches of our government relate and through federalism. It also does it by compelling negotiation in a fairly obvious way, and especially in Congress. But there is a third way that the Constitution deals with fundamental differences that were present at the time of its writing and that are present in the life of our society. And that is that it takes what seem to be competing ideas, necessarily competing ideas, and encompasses them both within the system. And so the, the most familiar example of this is really in, in the, the grand compromise that made the Constitution possible, the compromise between the large states and the small states. The large states wanted representation in Congress to function by population. The small states wanted all the states to be equal in representation. And at a certain point, the Connecticut delegation says, well, we have two houses here. Why don't we just have one of them look like this and the other look like that? And on the surface, that doesn't make any sense. You haven't decided how to solve this problem. And yet by containing the, the disagreement within the structure of the institution, you allow it to continue in such a way that both interests are represented and the tension between them is in a sense the, the, the life of the system. And actually, when you see that, you realize the Constitution does this over and over again and again, not only in setting up federalism and the design of the Congress. As you say, the, the nature of the presidency, there was a basic question. Is, is the president just executing the laws? Is the president basically just a, a glorified clerk? Or is the president the head of state and the, the most elevated figure in our politics? These are very different things. And the Constitution answers that question by saying, yes, the president is a glorified clerk and the president is a head of state. And the office just contains both of those things. And what that allows you to do is at different times, the system can kind of shift its weight without losing its balance and falling over. It can be different things given different kinds of needs and exigencies. And it doesn't have to resolve the problem. And there are some kinds of political disputes 
that were central to the the differences at the at the convention and that are central to the life of the American Republic that are just answered with a yes and and that's very frustrating it means the American system of government is not coherent and I think we have to accept that it's not simply coherent it doesn't answer to a clean political theory um, and that obviously is frustrating to political theorists inclined to cleanliness. And mm -hmm. I think that Woodrow Wilson was such a person. And he looked at the system and he said, this is just a mess. This doesn't make any sense. No one's clearly in charge. It pulls in all different directions. He had that, uh, that analogy, as you say, to, uh, to the Newtonian system and the Darwinian system. And he says, the Madisonian answer is Newtonian. It's this machine that's in balance. But in fact, our system of government is an organism and in an organism if the organs don't all pull in the same direction you're going to die um i think w wilson is just mistaken about the nature of political life and what he does above all and i think this is something that comes into clearest focus when you think about the constitution in terms of cohesion and in a divided time like ours is that wilson underestimates the danger of disunity he underestimates the risks involved in, in tension and disagreement and division. And he calls Madison's constitution overly simplistic because he says we're living in an industrializing time and the world's more complicated and maybe this worked back in the late 18th century, but it doesn't work in the late 19th century. And a lot of contemporary critics of the constitution, a lot of these kind of law professors who are tired of the law, and who've decided that we need to throw this away and have a much simpler democratic system, I think are making the same mistake. They fail to see, they call the Constitution simple-minded, but it's much more sophisticated than they are about what is really the most profound challenge to the life of a modern democratic nation, which is the challenge of internal diversity. Diversity is a term we use now to talk about demographics or to uh, or to talk about ethnicity and race, but it can also just mean diversity of views. Mm -hmm. um, and the simple reality of diversity that defines all modern societies, the way in which we are modern, um, is that our society contains intense disagreements. And the American Constitution, in a very unusual way, is built to contain the danger of that and to address the problems that creates and I think for that reason, not, because, not, 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 not from authority, not because it was Madison's, not because we've had it for so long, but because it is the answer to the problem we now face. For that reason, we have to reacquaint ourselves with the Constitution and recommit ourselves to it. I simply think that it is the solution and not the problem uh, in the moment we're living in. Um, okay, I want to get to some of that in a second, but I, I don't want to kill myself by not getting to this point I wanted to get to. Um, let me ask it this way. Is, um, I know your answer is going to be both, so that's fine. I'm just going <laughs> to stipulate that, but yep. I'm more interested in what comes after the both. Right. Um, is the Constitution um, a cultural document? Or is it a document that creates a culture? Yeah. Well, so sure, I'll say both. Um, but um, I, I think that for us, living now two centuries and more after its ratification, the Constitution is very much a document that creates culture. Um, it's not new to us, and it's worth it to us to consider what it was like when it was new and what was thought about when it was being drafted so that we can understand the reasons why it works the way it does. But we are creatures of the American Constitution in some very profound ways. The American character is a function of America's mode of governing itself in a way that I think runs very deep. Um, and the assumptions we make about what is involved in dealing with other people, about what rights we have, about what obligations we have, um, about what it means to live in society, are all very much shaped by our common history together and in turn also by the logic of the Constitution. So we live in a culture that I think has a lot to do with the kind of Constitution we have. 
And, you know, it's one of these things, I think Americans need to remind ourselves that we are an older nation, not a younger nation. We always tend to think of ourselves, and I think this is healthy sometimes, as a young nation, as just kind of an experiment, right? That's the term we love to use to describe American democracy. Well, this is a very successful experiment that has endured now for longer than any other exi modern existing democracy. Um, and so I think it, it, that has been the case for long enough that the American character is almost inseparable from the American Constitution. And so, by the way, is worry about the Constitution and criticism of the Constitution and worry about whether our republic can endure and can survive. I mean, this is so American, the sense that in this generation, if not in this election, it's all going to fall apart. This goes back very far. I mean, we live in a country where the national anthem is a song about barely surviving the night. Mm -hmm. um, it's just our attitude about ourselves. And I think we have to see that and not panic about it um, and, and see the good in it. And that good has a lot to do with the Constitution. All right. So one of the reasons why I asked that question is I wanted to hear your answer. But part of it is also, uh, as you know, in the 19th century, everyone thought our Constitution was the, was the bee's knees. And a lot of these newly independent nations in South America, they basically plagiarized our Constitution. It did not go well. No. So part of my question is, is about the why I bring up the, is it a cultural document? Was it a document fit for a specific culture at the time made up of specific people? You know, I'm, I'm a little whiggish about this stuff. Yep. Yep. Um, America had a lot of second sons who had, you know, escaped from, you know, primogeniture and were entrepreneurs. And there's a, a whole argument about this. And, you know, my whole spiel about Seymour Martin Lipset and, and Canada yep. versus the United States. So the question is, if the structure of it is so brilliant and works so well, why is it so hard to export? Yeah. Well, I think it is. Um, I, I think it was certainly a response to a particular American need in a particular American way. There's no doubt about that, that in, it, in, in the time of its creation, um, it was a cultural product um, and a, a product of a very particular culture in a very particular moment in time. But it was built to endure. Um, and I think that means that by now, uh, we are as much a product of our constitutional culture as it is a product of the American character. But these things can't really be separated. I think all those Latin American democracies, by the way, they, they imported a kind of misunderstanding of the American constitutional system, which put the, the, the executive in a central place in a way that our system actually doesn't do. Um, and so I wouldn't really attribute the failures of the 19th century Latin American democracies to uh, the American constitutional model. I, I, I think that the, the, the moment, the cultural moment the Constitution came out of is actually very important to understand because in part it, it was shaped by the same attitude that the American Revolution was shaped by, a, a worry about the danger of political power, especially centralized power, especially executive power. That's all there. But... The way in which the Constitution came from a different moment than the Declaration of Independence is that then there were 10 years of self-government, which went very, very poorly. Mm -hmm. And what went poorly in that period was an excess of democracy. The executives were all too weak. All of the governors, maybe except for New York, were just not nearly strong enough to actually function. Uh, the democracies were unpredictable and unwieldy. There were elections every year in most of the states, and the legislatures just swung back and forth very wildly. So that the Constitution, in a very unusual way, um, is built on both a concern about government being too strong and a concern about government being too weak. I think there's almost no other moment in our history when it would have been possible to produce the kind of balance that that moment produced and it happened not because these people were unusual geniuses, though they were in some ways. It happened because they'd been through a very peculiar experience that taught them first that the government can be dangerous to the rights of the people, and second, that government is necessary and social order is essential. And the Constitution really does contain both of those lessons at the same time in a way that's pretty unusual. But look, we're so different from the Canadians because of the Constitution as much as uh, as much as the other way around, as much as our constitution being different from theirs, um, because we're different people. 
Um, yeah, for listeners, for new listeners, because you know, you've all brings new people onto this podcast. Uh, <laughs> what we're referring to is Seymour Martin Lipset had this, he was a really brilliant guy. I knew him pretty well. Um, he was the former president of both the American Sociological Association and the American Political Science yeah. Association, which There's is a thing that couldn't happen anymore. Unbelievable. He, he couldn't possibly be it. president of either of those now, of oh, course. Exactly. But, uh... you know, I mean, <laughs> and, uh, and he always used to say the, the greatest natural experiment in political science and sociology was uh, between the United States and Canada because you had basically the same cultures, the same demographics, um, the same institutions, except one side of the border decided to stay royalist or loyalist, and one side of the border decided to... Um, you know, break away and start something new. And you'd say 200 years later, both countries at the same time decide to adopt the metric system and Canadians just like, right. okay. And Americans are like, screw you. That's witchcraft. And, mm -hmm. um, and I, I think, I think and there's one more element there and Lipset says this too, but that the, the, the mode of self-government of the Canadians came from 19th century Britain and not 18th century Britain. And mm, okay. yeah, yeah. That, that difference is actually important in, in that kind of character shaping way, too. There's a way that the Americans are a, a kind of Englishman that you would have found in 17th and 18th century Britain. Um, and it, 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 Burke says this, too, in his speeches on the American Revolution, that um, the, the obsession with taxes, the concerns about uh, constraining the power of legislatures... Those, those all come from a very particular moment in, in English history. And our system just still draws its inspiration in some ways from that moment because our character was shaped by it. And so I think Americans are still now the best form of the, uh, of the kind of rights of Englishmen uh, citizen that even the British ever had. They evolved away from it, and we kept it, and I think we're stronger for it. Um, all right, so we'll get back to the nuts and bolts poli sci in a second. Um, but I just want to get at this this core point. So part of your argument, which I agree with, is that the Constitution is is a both and, not an either or kind of thing. It has contradictions built into it. It has complexities built into it. As <clears throat> um. And I, I like the way you put it about how it can shift its weight without losing its balance. It's, you know, the president is both a petty bureaucrat and also commander in chief and kind of a quasi monarch, at least for a little while and different roles for different situations. Um, it seems to me that, that, you know, Irving Kristol, praise be upon him, uh, you know, one of his greatest essays was the American Revolution as a successful revolution. Yeah. And, and part of his, the core part of his argument was that it took human nature seriously. And it seems to me that human nature is very much what you're describing in the Constitution. It's complex. It's got good elements. It's got bad elements. And not to say that the bad elements are bad, it's just that the bad elements in certain situations can be bad if not properly channeled and utilized and yep. we contain multitudes we contain um contradictions and so in a sense the constitution itself is based on a specific metaphysics a specific yes. conception of who mankind what mankind is who we are we are flawed crooked crooked timber of humanity and all of that um So first of all, just so I can get out that your quote from Madison, my, the reason I have a quibble with it is you say, the quote, quote is, and it's, it's the lead quote of your book, it's, as long as the reason of man continues fallible and he is at liberty to exercise it, different opinions will be formed. Now, I agree with that. You obviously agree with that. But I, I think the, my problem with it is it lowballs the issue. The reason of man need not be fallible there will still be disagreements because what is what qualifies as the pursuit of happiness for one person qualifies as uh, a life of misery for another person. And it's not that one person is more right than the other person. For some people being a Marine 
it would seem like, uh, you know, punishment for a crime and for other people, it would be the fulfillment of all their hopeful hopes and aspirations. There is just a rich diversity of human desires and human self-conceptions and communal self-conceptions. And that doesn't mean that all of them are wrong, except for one person who has, has it all figured out and is really tolerant of all these fallible people. And it seems to me that that part of the metaphysic is really at the heart of the Constitution, is this the, the idea of competition. Madison is, makes no claim that the dairy farmers of Delaware are worse people than the widget makers of Connecticut. It's right. that to each his own, right? And yeah. that well, is something that yes is no. inherent in it, so, right? Yes, I agree with that. I, I think there is... There, there are moments in Madison, and of course Jefferson thinks this way. Jefferson thinks the farmers are much better people than the widget makers, and he's he's mistaken about that in an interesting way, I think. But I, I would say I agree with what you say, but I, I think that it points to the kind of middle ground that you're describing in a way that's worth articulating. So if the question is – the core political question, um, the, the, the question for which politics exists – is what should we do, right? It is about when there are moments of communal decision that have to be reached. Not all moments are like that. Much of the time, we don't have to answer that kind of question, and we can do different things. And uh, and and freedom exists to make sure that politics doesn't have to answer every question. And certainly, the framers uh, believed that. But there are times when we have to answer the question, "What should we do?" and in those moments, living with the fact of disagreement, um, I think may be best understood as a kind of concession to the simple fact that no one knows everything and no one can be trusted with all the power. It may be that there is a right answer. I think in some ways there is a right answer. Um, and I think that to a lot of moral questions, there are answers that are more right and there are answers that are more wrong. But the fact is that we are all fallen um, all of our, the reason of each of us is fallible and, uh, we make a lot of mistakes and the constitution ultimately is premised in the notion that no one should be trusted with all the power. That's frustrating to people who think that democracy should have all the power. It's frustrating to people who think that experts should have all the power. It's frustrating to everybody who thinks that anybody should have all the power because it does have a constrained view of what is possible for human beings. And yet at the same time, it has a very elevated view of what human beings deserve. And I think that's really contained in that quote. I mean, Madison says the reason of man is fallible and he is at liberty to exercise it. The human person is deserving of freedom in a way that is distinct to our humanity. We're all equally deserving of it. We're all equally dignified. I might say we're all equally made in a divine image, and yet we're all equally uh, incapable of perfect reasoning, of perfect knowledge, of perfect anything. We've all got a lot of problems, and yet we're all pretty extraordinary things called human beings. And the fact that you live in a free society where we take each other seriously enough to protect one another's core rights, which we have because we are human beings, um, and yet that we have to make decisions together means we need some kind of system for dealing with the fact of disagreement. I, I think that can be a function of a view that says there just is no right answer to any of these questions, and so we have to just work it out. It can also be a function of, of a view that says no one knows the right answer in a perfect way, and we have to work it out. As a practical matter, these are two different kinds of anthropologies and maybe of even metaphysics, but as a practical matter, uh, they point in the same direction, and they point towards the same kind of free society that ultimately thinks it's not legitimate to coerce people. And given the fact that no one has the authority to coerce everyone, we have to work things out in this kind of democratic, republican way. So I, I, I do think there's an underlying anthropology to the Constitution, and I do think that it is a kind of classical, we might say, conservative anthropology um, but it points in the direction of freedom precisely because we are all equal. And whether you want to say we're equal in rights or you want to say that we're equally fallible, um, those both point toward the kind of free society that we're privileged to live in. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with 
any of that. I, I think, um, I think the point, you know, part, part of my argument for a very long time is that the essence of conservatism, which is very difficult to define, um, as you may have discovered in your own life. Mm -hmm. um, more and more so, too. Yeah, well, you know, when William F. Buckley was asked to write an essay to define conservatism, he says the title of it was something like Notes to a Working Definition of an Empirical, def you know, thing of conservatism. <laughs> Uh, reluctantly given. I mean, it was this crazy title because he really just didn't want to let go of the chess piece and say, that's yeah. my move. This is what conservatism is. But part of, you know, I've been writing this now for 20 years, that part of the essence of conservatism is comfort with contradiction. Yes. Is just this idea that not all good things go together, that um, that philosophical monism and all these things doesn't work. And it seems to me, I, I don't want to turn off the constitution i don't want to turn off people to the constitution by saying it's conservative because part of your project right. here is to explain right. to people of the center left and the left that it's it's their constitution too and they should love it too but there is something fun there's a fundamental conservative anthropology or, or metaphysics reflected in the constitution precisely because it does not yeah. definitively say these things and when you said earlier this is the point i want to make when you said earlier that that it it thinks there are some things that are right and even there what it does is it just simply puts those things on a very high shelf called the bill of rights yep. and says yeah you can get that stuff down it's just we're going to make it really hard because we want to make sure you guys have thought it through and um that's right and that's a really I, important I, point for people it's like you can change the constitution it just it has to be hard and it should be hard yeah I think these are all very, very important points, and they're connected. I, I would say, first of all, I very much agree that conservatism is defined by a certain kind of comfort with, with incoherence or with contradiction. Um, and, and this, to me, is, my own approach to this is very rooted in Edmund Burke, for whom this is a very important point. And it's not that there's not an underlying order to the universe, right? but that our access to it is not direct and that no one has perfect access to it. And that ultimately we live with an awful lot of contradiction. I would say a one sentence summary of everything that Edmund Burke wrote would be to say we should never follow any idea to its logical conclusion. Um, because all of our ideas are only partially right. And if you take them all the way and assume they're completely right, you will destroy everything good in the world. I think that's basically true. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very important for us to be able to live with that fact. It's a function of what human beings are. Um, and, and certainly the Constitution contains within it that conception. And it's part of why it has always been so frustrating to people who are not comfortable with contradiction and who think that what, what liberalism has discovered is the ultimate perfect formula for w w what shape the future should take, rather than that what liberalism has discovered um, is the centrality of human freedom. And therefore, the necessity to allow um, to allow the free society to take the kind of complicated, incoherent form that it should take. There's room within that society for people to live their lives and the lives of their communities in accordance with very solid commitments to an idea of the truth. Um, but our society allows for a diversity of these, contradictory as that may seem. And that's really the secret of it. That's the source of a lot of its of a lot of its strength. And so I think it's very important to see that that conception is implicit within the Constitution, and it's why it's frustrating to Woodrow Wilson. It's why it's frustrating to contemporary progressives, because it doesn't take any of its own ideas all the way to the end. It doesn't say this is the one thing there is to know. And a lot of people who judge the Constitution harshly now will say, well, it's not representative enough. And you say, well, representative is one of the things it is meant to be, right. but it's not the only thing, and it's not the only criteria by which to judge uh, the way we live. Um, all right, so let's 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 talk about that. You should, I should let you move product here. Um, we can circle back to my anthropology in a bit. Uh, the electoral college. I'm yes. I spent much of my adult life defending electoral college. <laughs> I still defend it in theory. Yeah. Um, I'm less enamored these days with it in practice. 
Um, so why don't you make the case, both the theor theoretical and why we should continue to be committed to it in practice? Yeah. The Electoral College, you know, is one of these things where you really have to take seriously the, the concept of Chesterton's fence to think it through. Because, and, and th that idea, um, I'm sure your listeners know this, but basically that before you uh, allow yourself to take down something that has stood for a long time, you should make sure you understand why it's there. Um, and the Electoral College is most important for why it's there. It's there out of a concern that the direct election of the chief executive will lead, on the one hand, to demagogues, if the chief executive is chosen directly by the people. On the other hand, could lead to an excessively weak executive if, if the president is chosen by Congress, which were basically the two options that the convention considered before landing on the, uh, on the Electoral College. There was, the, the, there was a real novelty to what they did in creating the presidency. A strong national executive that is somehow elected was a new idea. It had not existed before. Um, there was a strong sense that something like it was necessary, but exactly how to do it was hard to say. And what the convention was going for never really worked. And I think even the, the friendliest friend of the Constitution has to acknowledge that. The idea was that there would, would actually be some deliberation in the state electoral college meetings. Um, and some discussion about who should be president. And that never really happened. The Electoral College from the beginning was a kind of uh, rubber stamp on the outcome of the election in the states. And so what we have in the Electoral College is we choose our president through 50 popular votes that are then weighted by population. That's the American system for choosing the chief executive. A lot of people who criticize this say, well, it's not democratic enough. It's not representative enough. Uh, and so there should just be a direct election. To that, I say the president was never intended to be a representative of anything. The presidency is an administrative job. The idea that one person even could represent 330 million people, uh, I think is just a mistake about politics. It's a distinctly Wilsonian sort of mistake. Um, the president is elected in order to be kept accountable not out of some sense that he could possibly be representative. Representing a diverse country requires a plural institution. That's Congress. Um, other, other critics will say that it's much less democratic than the way other democracies choose their chief executive. And I think that's just actually not true. Um, mm -hmm. the, the parliamentary systems, most of them, France is the one exception, um, don't have a direct election of a chief executive either. The, the British have had three prime ministers since the last election. And who chose those people? They were chosen by a majority of the majority party in parliament, basically 260 people who all have the same political interest and all went to the same two universities. That's not more democratic than the Electoral College. But they're trying to solve the same problem, which is a concern that the direct election of the chief executive will lead to the wrong kind of president. Now, I, I think if we did that, we would have more demagogues elected to the presidency. But that's not to say that we've had none. The Electoral College certainly has not always worked uh, to achieve that purpose. Um, and I think it's, it, it, it has not always worked the way it was intended. But to me, in thinking about the Constitution from the point of view of cohesion and unity in this book, there's also an additional advantage to the Electoral College, which I don't think I had really quite perceived before this project, which is that the Electoral College forces our presidential elections to happen somewhere near the middle of the electorate. In the absence of the Electoral College, the parties would focus on the places where they can get the most people out. The Democrats would focus on every last Democrat in California. And in fact, their popular vote majorities, when they've had them in the, in the 21st century, have all come from California. More than 100% of Hillary Clinton's popular vote majority came from California. Um, Republicans maybe would focus on the South or where it's easiest for them to get people out. And the elections would look like each party talking to its own staunchest supporters and trying to make sure they show up, which is what a lot of our elections look like. But because you don't win by winning California or the Deep South, you can get as many of your people out in your strongest place as you want to. If you didn't win Michigan, if you didn't win Pennsylvania, you didn't win the election. That means that our elections have to be about those issues that make the parties uncomfortable, those issues where people could go either way. Um, and in those places, 
where the election could go either way. And I think for us in a divided time, that's another advantage of the Electoral College. It's another way in which the system forces us to think about those places where our partisanship is least intense and least strong. So I think there are great advantages to it. The Electoral College is not a perfect way to choose the chief executive, certainly not. And it's had all kinds of complicated problems over time. But I think it is better than the alternatives that are proposed by the people who are trying to reform it, and that it's a lot better than a national direct election would be. Yeah, I mean, just to put a pin in that, the uh, you're right about the exception with France, and, and France is kind of been changing its electoral system in weird ways lately anyway. Yes. But try to figure out exactly how the the top person, Olaf Scholz or whoever it is in Germany, gets yes, their job. Right. And it makes the Electoral College seem like um, yeah. a fairly straightforward class president election. I mean, it is – there's there are very, very, very few countries where the the, the maximum leader, the, the, the head of state, the head of government, and it gets complicated because – in yeah. other countries, they split those functions, but very few places is the guy who's making the real decisions, the equivalent of our president, um, directly elected by the people. And yet the, the way people talk about our system is they assume the existence of political systems that, and economic systems too, because they do the same thing about you know socialism in Scandinavia without mm -hmm. actually knowing anything about it. Um, all right, so this delicate balance, this this wonderful... Uh, poetic ambiguity um, that's in the Constitution. Um, I think we both agree that the administrative state has been one of the main problems, one of the main yes. threats to that, right? Right. But what about um, the Civil War amendments? Mm -hmm. um, I think, just spoiler alert for people, you and I both think the right side won the Civil War, right? And we're yes, pro four 14th Amendment. But um, wouldn't this sort of rich pluralism be richer if you actually had the stakes of politics matter more at the local level? And that would have, and if you hadn't had the incorporation, didn't that throw the whole idea a little out of balance? Is I guess the question. Yeah, I, I think so. But um, the Civil War amendments were a recognition of the fact that the original balance of federalism was inadequate. Um, the, the logic of federalism coming out of the Constitutional Convention was that the states would be in charge of everything except interstate commerce and what we would think of as defense and diplomacy. Um, and the Constitution essentially tried to skirt the question of slavery by assigning it to the states. So that if you look at the very few places, only really three places where slavery is even addressed in any indirect way in the Constitution, they all essentially revolve around federalism and assign the problem to the states. Even the extension of, of the global slave trade for 20 years, which is in the original Constitution, Congress can't prohibit it for 20 years, is described in terms of states that want to import slaves until 1808 can do so. It's all assigned to the states. I think the Civil War obviously compelled uh, federal legislators to recognize that there was another element of uh, the American idea that had to be nationalized beyond uh, the power over interstate commerce and defense and diplomacy. And that really was the protection of basic rights to all citizens. Um, that also was something that the national government would have a role in. It was especially focused on race, but it was also worded in a way that was not simply constrained to race. And I think the, the best way to think about the post-Civil War amendments in this context, and especially the 14th Amendment, is as a rebalancing of federalism. Um, the trouble is that the 14th Amendment left open a lot of questions about exactly what that was supposed to mean in a lot of distinct circumstances, especially outside of race, but also within it. And it expected and assigned to Congress the role of defining these things in legislation. And for the most part, that did not happen. And instead, these questions ended up as questions before the courts, 
And there are, are just a set of terms in the 14th Amendment that became central to the Supreme Court's expansion of the role of the national government over the subsequent century. The court at first stepped up to constrain progressive economic policy using these ideas, and then to uh, reinforce and expand progressive social policy using these ideas. And I think it is incumbent upon us to see the limits, the boundaries of the 14th Amendment's expansion of federal power. It definitely complicated the situation, but with good reason. I mean, I think we did see that the Constitution, for, for in order to make possible the kinds of deals and bargains that were necessary for its adoption, uh, skirted the issue of slavery in a way that ultimately turned out to be unjust and wrong and worse than that and that needed to be addressed, that were addressed in a way that no one wanted to see repeated, um, and that ultimately federalism did need to be rebalanced. But it's left us with a lot of open questions now about the role of the federal government um, that we have to wrestle with. There's no way around that. How many of the original drafters of the Constitution do you think would have been fine with the thrust of the 14th Amendment at the time of the drafting, like, like, yeah. like how many, I mean, obviously the anti-federalists and Southerners would have huge problems with it, but yes, you know, would George Not Washington many. have been um, okay with it? I, yeah. I think some of them would have, I think the, the, the most ardent nationalists among them probably would have been, um, Hamilton, James Wilson. Um, it's hard to know about Madison. Madison is really wily. I mean, he was really a nationalist, um, and wanted the federal government to have veto power over state laws. Um, mm -hmm. he, he proposed that at the Constitutional Convention. Um, and so it's possible, uh, although of course he was a Southerner and, and would have had other kinds of reactions to it. Um, but I would say some, but not most of the original framers of the Constitution. Um, the lesson of the Civil War was a lesson that America had to learn. It was not, it was not something that everybody already knew. Um. Yeah, no, there's this, uh, John McCormick does this bit, he got it from somebody about how dumb people say, what was the Civil War about? Slavery. Um, uh, Middlebrow people say, what, when he's asking what the Civil War was about, they say, well, it's really complicated. And then the most adroit scholars and serious students of the Civil War, when you ask them, what was the Civil War about? They'll say, slavery. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and, that's right. Um, um, I, I know we're coming up on an hour and you were on this, you know, massive book tour. I'm sure you're going to be on the view next. <laughs> right. Um, but, um, um, I, I can't, you know, since you are like a category by, unto yourself uh, on the remnant bingo card, um, it would be wrong not to ask, does the constitution as both as evolved and also as intended work with weak parties? Yeah. Yeah, this is a great question, and, and I come to the question of parties toward the end of the book. Um, there's, a, there's a chapter on parties, which, of course, are not a constitutional institution. They're extra-constitutional. Um, in they a way kind of that, emanate from it by the way the system is set up, right? Absolutely. I agree with that. And, and that chapter tries to lay that out. You know, it, it, its hero is Martin Van Buren, who is one of my heroes, too, and who understood that the logic of, of the Madisonian Constitution actually required party politics of a certain sort, uh, of a sort that would select um, for political office holders who were good at coalition building. And I would say, and you know, this connects to the question that I think just has to be raised about uh, uh, any argument in favor of the Constitution today, which is that the system isn't working now. It's mm -hmm. not working well. Um, it hasn't failed, but it's not working well. And I think the 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 purpose of looking to the logic of the constitution in the way that i try to do in this book is not to suggest that it is working well but rather to help us think about what it is that needs fixing and what that would look like because i think that even among people who agree that the system isn't working well there's a profound underlying disagreement about what it is not doing and therefore what needs to change that's very true when you think about congress I'm, I'm a token conservative in a lot of rooms of people on the left who think Congress is broken, and I disagree with all of them about how it's broken. Mm -hmm. um, 
they think it's just not passing the laws they want, and I think it's not facilitating cross-partisan bargaining, and that that's the purpose of the institution. And those ideas push us in opposite directions when it comes to how to reform the institution. Um, the same is true of the party system, I think, in a lot of ways, so that I think you'd find a lot of agreement now that the party system seems somehow to be broken. I think that the progressive political scientists of the middle of the 20th century broke it, and that they broke it because they didn't like what the American party system does, which is that it builds broad, messy, complicated coalitions. Right. That's how our system works, and it's why the party system is a good fit for the constitutional system. But they want, and this was true of Woodrow Wilson too, they want a, a coherent, perfectly accountable kind of party system where you run on a, a, a cohesive platform, and then the election is a choice between platforms, and whoever wins gets to uh, enact their platform. That's not insane. That's how the parliamentary systems work. It's not how the American system works. And I think the way the American system works is better, not worse than that. It does require strong parties, especially as parties that select office holders, that select by some process of actual deliberation and thought the people who would be best equipped to broaden coalitions. I would say this is a general matter. What, what's wrong with our system now is that we've forgotten how to build broad coalitions. And increasingly, we forget even that we should build broad coalitions. The two parties are not really trying to do that. They're trying to get their most devoted voters out. And part of the reason for that is the primary system that begins the political process with the question, what do the most devoted voters of each party want to see? And that is the wrong question to start with. Um, I think the party system sets us off on the wrong foot in every election cycle by letting the people who least want bargaining and accommodation and complicated broad coalitions decide who should be in the system. And so we do have to think about the parties. We have to think about how to strengthen them. We also have to think about how to help them do their core job, which is to win elections broadly, um, to build the kind of majorities that could endure Neither of our parties does that. We've lived now through 30 years of two minority parties at the same time in American politics. We've never had a stretch that long. Um, and I, I think it is not durable. But in order to get out of it, the parties would have to see that they've both been losing in this period, not winning. And that does require a kind of reacquaintance with the logic of our constitutional system, which is what the book tries to offer. Yeah, I mean, Trying to explain to Martin Van Buren or to James Madison the Trump team's decision to throw Larry Hogan overboard because right. they would rather exactly. have a Democrat is yeah it would, I'd rather so lose insane. than compromise is a way to lose that is what it is a way to do and I think we've we've come to the point of thinking now that bargaining in politics is weakness, that it's a kind of failure of nerve, failure of principle, and that what's needed instead is saying really loudly and clearly why you're right and they're wrong. And the fact is that refusing to engage in the broadening of coalitions, saying I'd rather lose than have that guy in my party, is only a way to lose. That is not a way to fight effectively. And the way to fight effectively requires a grasp of coalitional politics that I think is implicit in our constitution, but we've increasingly been forgetting in our political life. Um, yeah, I, I think that undersells it because I think it's not just that it's seen as a sign of weakness. It's, it's seen as a sign of collaboration with the enemy. Yeah, exactly. Right. And the, the, argument even... for, the argument for coalition building is not an argument for civility or for being nice, or for some kind of moderation. I don't think any of those things are what we, should be, what we should be interested in in politics. It is actually an argument for finding a way to allow your voice to be part of how our society decides how to act together. It's part of winning. It's the only way that is available to us to win in a diverse society, to win anything. And that we fail to see that, and instead think that winning means forcing the other side to hear that thing that I hear on Fox, but they never hear, that's not a way to win. 
that's not a way to achieve anything. And I, to be confused about that, I think, is to really lose sight of what our politics is for at the end of the day. Um, so you and I both get fairly exasperated. You hide it better than I do um, with catastrophism, right? This idea that yeah. this next election is the most important election ever and that this, the, the existence of America is in the balance and all that. And I think one of the reasons why we're in the mess we're in is because people have been saying that for 30 years. And um, that said, can you make a case? I mean, can you, yeah. can you steal man? The, I mean, the, the problem is, is that you do have this guy right. who is utterly unschooled on purpose with anything that any of the higher understandings of like, I think he would burst into flame if he touched your book. Let's yes. put it that way. And so. So somebody how, should how buy you, it for him. How do you adjudicate this problem is the, the concern that maybe, you know, cause the moral of the story of crying wolf is that eventually the wolf comes and eats the kid. Yep. Right. How do you, how do you adjudicate yep. that problem in this election? Yeah, so my my confidence in the Constitution is not an argument for complacence. It's not an argument for not worrying about the problems our country has. I think our country has serious problems. Now, I do think that it always does, and so that our generation should not think that things are worse for us than they've ever been, and so we have the luxury of giving up on the work of sustaining all this, which is, I think, where a lot of catastrophism points. It's a kind of escapism that just says, well, I'm tired of making this work. Those other people have wrecked it, and so let's just wreck it too. Um, I certainly disagree with that. But I also think that looking to the logic of the Constitution is a way to understand what the danger we confront is. Because I am worried about the state of American life. I am worried about American politics. But I'm worried about it in the way that the framers of the Constitution were. I think they were right about what we should worry about, um, that we should worry about the danger of demagogues. They were certainly right about that, and this is a moment to keep that in mind, that we should worry about the danger of unrestrained majorities. They were certainly right about that too, and this is a moment to keep that in mind, and that they were worried about the tendency of democratic polities to undervalue social peace, to think the stability of the system is something we can take for granted. So let's just break the boundaries, do everything we can. And, you know, the alternative to, uh, to, to having to deal with these damn people is that we win. Well, that's not actually the alternative to having to deal with these damn people. The alternative is the breakdown of fundamental social order. And you don't win when that happens, whoever you are. We're in a very strange moment when a lot of minorities in our society are arguing for the elimination of the protections of minorities in our constitutional system. And if you empower a Caesar, I'm pretty sure that that person will not be a progressive law professor or a traditionalist Catholic. Mm -hmm. That is not what would happen if we got rid of this system. So I think recovering our sense of what the system is for and what it's meant to protect us against is especially essential in a time when it is right to worry about the stability of the system, and that it can help us to think about what needs reinforcing, that it can help us to think about what needs renewing, what needs fixing. It's not a way to say, don't worry, everything's fine. I don't think everything's fine, but it's a way to organize our concerns so that they point not to catastrophism and everything depends on this next election, but toward the work of building the future so that it's worthy of our children living in it. I, I think that the, the, the problem we have in contemporary American politics presents itself in a lot of ways as a kind of failure to think about the future, so that everybody thinks between us and the future, there is some catastrophe. That is the catastrophism that our politics lives with. So maybe it's a climate catastrophe or the end of democracy, or it's a fiscal catastrophe, or it's cultural breakdown. But whatever it is, we don't actually have to think about how to build the future, because that's not going to happen there's going to be a total collapse. Well, I think in some ways, the reality is actually more challenging than that. We do have to think about building the future. It's just going to come one day at a time. 
And yeah, we have fiscal problems and, and there's, you know, there's, there's, there's climate and there's democracy. We have to worry about all those things. But none of them is going to bring everything crashing down so that we don't have to worry about the everyday work of citizenship and, and statesmanship. We do have to worry about it because that's actually how the future happens, is one day at a time through our politics and our life together. And that means that the responsibility we have is the same as the responsibility that every prior generation has had. That's good news and bad news. It means a lot of hard work ahead of us. But to think about what that work involves, we do have to understand things like why our Constitution works the way it does. I could go on, but uh, I think that's probably a great place to end this. And uh, Yuval Levin, thank you so much for doing this. Thanks so much, John. I appreciate it.